Okay, Netflix's three-body problem. It's become a bit of a streaming sensation, hasn't it? Indeed. So let's chat about it. Surprised you decided to talk about this, Commander. Didn't think you were a fan of shows whose entire season is dropped all at once. I'm not usually. The pressure of having to watch the whole thing before being inundated with spoilers makes for a very unsatisfying experience. But who can resist what's supposed to be an epic sci-fi tale? Not us! Exactly. Now, before we go further, we'll be talking about plot points and revealing major aspects of the story, so... SPOILER ALERT! SHIELDS UP! We also won't be making any comparisons to the books this series was adapted from. There's always alterations when a story moves from one art form to another. Some good, some bad. And this won't be a focus of this conversation. Damn straight! What works on the page doesn't necessarily work as a visual experience, and vice versa. So our focus is on the Netflix show as a self-contained piece of entertainment. Personally, I was very excited by the title and the idea this might embrace actual scientific theories, weaving them into an epic story. And does it? Well, yes and no. They do touch upon many concepts, not least of which the actual three-body problem, multiple dimensions, quantum entanglement, the wow signal, interstellar communications, advanced VR, and more. But they didn't really go into much detail. This show isn't a science lecture, Doc. The story, which is spread across eight episodes, uses those as a springboard for its narrative. It's fun to spot them if you're a nerd, but if you're not, it won't hinder the narrative. I was expecting more, to be honest. Especially the concept of the actual three-body problem, which highlights a fundamental flaw with modern scientific understanding. The maths work because they appear to match the observation and can predict how gravity affects multiple bodies to a degree. But at its core, if more than two objects of similar mass are involved, chaos inevitably ensues on paper. And we don't yet have any idea what's really going on. Couple that with all the stars blinking at the end of the first episode and the fact science didn't appear to work anymore, leading many scientists to kill themselves with some seeing a countdown in front of their eyes, even when they cut their own eyes out. That was pretty creepy. It all made me think that the show was hinting that what we were seeing was taking place inside a simulation. You mean like the Doctor Who episode Extremis? Exactly. There's even a scene in that story where scientists blow themselves up as they realize they're not real. Kind of like what the scientists in this show were doing. The world as a simulation concept was explored pretty well in the underrated movie The Thirteenth Floor. Ah, surprised you didn't go with The Matrix. Too obvious an example, Mouse. Plus, I think more people should see The Thirteenth Floor. Anyway, let's get back to the show. I started with a complete blank canvas. I knew of the show's existence, of course but chose to avoid as much info as possible, including not watching any of the trailers. I'd heard good things about it and the series of books it came from. It's the first translated novel to ever win a Hugo Award. Exactly. So in a way, its reputation preceded it. And the first two episodes were sublime. The way we moved back and forth between the decades kept me interested. From the horrors of the Cultural Revolution to the advanced VR goggles and the puzzle within them, it was all very well done. We were confronted with an engrossing, multi-layered mystery, absolutely fascinating. But then, cracks in the narrative began to appear by the third episode. What do you mean by cracks? Well, you know when you're following a story which you're fully immersed in, but something happens which doesn't fit with the rest of the universe that's been created around you, and your brain sits up and says, what the hell? Yeah? That's what I mean by cracks. In that episode... Mike Evans, one of the leaders who's in touch with this Sante, the aliens, chats with them, reading them one of Earth's fairy tales. It's implied that this is not the first time this has happened, and he may well have been doing this for months, years, if not decades. But it turns out the Sante hadn't yet grasped the concept that humans feel differently from one another. Then, in episode 4, the Sante explained to Mike that they do not hide their intentions, that when one of them knows something, They all know it. They don't understand the concept of stories, because to them, recounting an event that didn't take place is a form of lying, of deceit, and liars cannot be trusted. So they cease communication. (laughs) Ha! Are those aliens the same as the ones from Galaxy Quest? Historical documents. (laughs) Ha! Classic. Powerful though that scene was, it didn't make sense. How so? Take the VR game, for instance. The game creates a world that is made up, and although the mathematical problem the players face is real, the events within it aren't. 
So should it not be seen by the aliens as a form of lying? Wouldn't that discussion have happened during the creation of that game, since it's based on alien tech and couldn't have been built without their help, and the AI within it works with the Santé? That does raise a few questions. Has the crack. And in fact, as a result of this, that crack spread forward and back along the storyline. If the Santi truly are incapable of lying, do not understand deception and deceit, how were they able to covertly affect the advanced science labs and compel scientists to kill themselves or abandon their research? I hadn't thought of that. Also, back in episode 2 when they first made contact with the UNG, the alien who sends a message states, Do not answer. I am a pacifist in this world. You are lucky that I am the first to receive your message. I am warning you. Do not answer. If you respond, we will come. Your world will be conquered. Do not answer. Damn! So why did Yi Wenji respond and invite them then? Because her people at that time showed how reckless they were with the planet, and I guess she thought being invaded would be a better alternative for the world. Some would call her a traitor. I'm sure many have. So the Santi tell us they don't understand lies and deception, while at the same time, members of their species hide information from each other, which is a form of deceit. Not so different from humans, eh? On the one hand, they're presented as refugees, escaping a planet with a highly unpredictable and devastating orbit, honest to a fault, incapable of lying, seeking only self-preservation, while on the other, they are manipulative, deceitful, and, well, liars. There are even different factions, one of which is more pacifist than the other, and is against the planned invasion. It's confusing. Well, you're missing the obvious. Which is? That all this VR test uh, and the way they communicate with Evans is just their way to deceive. It's all a lie, and the Santi are not at all as they tell Evans they are. That's very true. It would explain a great many things. Like how at the end the AI shows Wade a head countdown and himself with his eyes gouged out. Clearly a made-up image, a deception on her part. Hmm. Good point. You could argue that by then they had learned about deceit and were incorporating that behavior into themselves somehow. Yeah, but it doesn't explain how they did it before they learned about it from Evans. This might be revealed in a later season, so let's move on. Later on in episode 4, Jin infiltrates Evans' group. Now, I have a big problem with that scene, especially after having watched so many covert ops movies and TV shows. When you arrest everyone, you have to keep pretending your asset is one of the people being arrested don't blow their cover. Pretty rookie mistake. Thomas Wade is supposed to be this big boss with the big plan, capable of seeing the big picture. And yet, Jin is removed from the room even before everyone's been handcuffed. And what happens because of that? A bloodbath. Plus, you don't know if you need more information. Best to keep your asset undercover as long as possible should you need them later, no? I've also got a nitpick about that episode, if I may. Well, of course, Mouse. As Jin drives to the location of that secret meeting, Wade tells her to leave her phone behind. Yet, when she's in the ambulance, her phone's magically there by the trolley for her to chat with Will. Maybe Dashi gave it to her? He wasn't in the ambulance long enough for him to do so. Let's add it to the list. But to be honest, this is pretty minor compared to what happened to Judgment Day in episode 5. The converted oil tanker? The Panama Canal scene? Yeah. Now, this was a very dramatic and traumatic event. I'd say it was the turning point for the whole season because after that the story goes in a totally different direction. Gone are the fun VR adventures and covert meetings, and now we're in full war preparations. But visually striking though this was, it just didn't work for me. That entire sequence starts with Dad Chi convincing Augie to create her nanofibers for Wade's plan. The ones the aliens told her not to work on, on threat of restarting her head countdown? Yeah. I wonder what would have happened if someone else in the lab had decided to overrule her and continue the production. Would her head countdown have restarted? even though it was out of her control? We'll never know. For such a huge research organization, though, it was lucky she alone had the say-so to start or stop the project. You can't say that again. Anyway, for the good of humanity, Augie agrees to restart production in the dead of night, and as luck would have it, no countdown for her that time. Phew, that was lucky. That's because the Santi were altering their plans after what they learned from Evans, and stop protecting the humans that were on their side. Indeed, but no one knew this at the time. As far as everyone knew, her brain could have exploded or something. So, yeah, very lucky, but that's not the problem I had with this. You see, 
Wade and his team needed to acquire information contained somewhere on the ship, likely in the form of a hard drive, but they didn't really know what they were looking for. He and others discuss at length how they must go in quickly to avoid the risk of someone on board destroying the data. A valid concern. Yes, it is. So why was destroying the Judgment Day the play they decided to go with? They sliced everything and everyone in a horribly slow process, including all the children. Not only will this be on horrific, the ends justify the means. I disagree. There was absolutely no need for this. Wade knew, thanks to Jin, that the aliens wouldn't get to Earth for another 400 years. They had plenty of time on their hands. There was no need to kill everyone and risk destroying the very data they sought. Turns out the data was intact. Yeah. Everything else was destroyed, sliced and diced. The ship, the equipment, men, women, and children. No one and nothing survived, but the one hard drive they needed was perfectly intact. That's stretch believability if you ask me. And you know what would have been better? Covert infiltration. Exactly. Had they not messed up the meeting Jane attended, she could have remained a covert asset. Who knows, give her a few weeks, months, years even. They could have got the data safely another way, with Jin or someone else even. They had 400 years. What's a year or two to save the lives of all those children? They estimated that there were over a thousand people on board. Considering what's happening in the real world right now, I thought this was a seriously questionable decision by the writers. Didn't this happen in the book? I haven't read the book, as you know, but from what I've heard, it did happen, but there was one crucial difference. There were no children on board. Not only was this a piece of gratuitous, horrific murder, but they had no way of knowing that the info they so desperately needed would be unscathed. It was disturbing and very unsatisfying. That is not what good guys do. Yeah, who are we supposed to be rooting for here? One thing, though. If those nanofibers could so effortlessly cut through, well, everything, how come they didn't cut through the pillars they were attached to? Mmm, Ogi had created special nanofiber-resistant pillars? Add it to the list. Duly noted. Now, the end of episode 5 redeemed itself by apparently creating a massive problem for the humans. The Santi disrupted every technological communications device, replacing what's on every screen with you are bugs, and covered the sky in a mirror-like dimensional reflection with a giant eye looking down on all humans. Sauron's got nothing on these aliens. Terrifying and genius. How are the humans going to be able to fight off a super advanced species if they can't even use their most advanced tech anymore or even look at the stars? Exactly. I thought it would lead to a super interesting development, an imprisoned species trying to come up with a novel way to survive against overwhelming odds, having essentially been thrown back to the start of the industrial age. But that's not what happened. All of that was reset by the time the next episode rolled. Sure, there was a bit of panic on the streets, but that was quickly forgotten. The sky was clear again, and all the tech was available once more. What was the point of that? Likely to cause fear. But the aliens won't get there for 400 years. Nothing's going to happen for generations. It doesn't make sense, which is why it made the list. The next two episodes dealt with the aftermath of the revelation of the coming alien invasion, while the story focuses on really good human drama. Yeah, I'd like that Ogi couldn't cope with what her technology had enabled. Which sensible, empathic person could? She had become death, the cheese wire of worlds. Meanwhile, Saul's pretty much relegated to being a carer for... Anyone who's around, really. Well, he did say that if he hadn't come up with a revolutionary theory by the time he got to 30, his scientific prospects were over anyway. Let's be honest here. There's nothing wrong with being a carer. It's a hard, vital, and thankless task. But it's true. In a story filled with geniuses, he sure did pick the shortest straw. I was quite surprised that, despite the technology being crippled and then uncrippled, Humanity was making remarkable technological strides. Necessity is the mother of all invention. Well, they weren't making any revolutionary advances because that scientific path was still blocked by the Santé, but damn it! They were perfecting cryogenic sleep, designing nuclear propulsion spacecrafts, and even mentioned a base on the moon. I'm thinking this crippling tech, though a clever means to limit humanity's advancement by the Santé, was also there for narrative convenience. That way, New tech would never be too far away from what we, the viewer, can comprehend. The aliens should have kept jamming all electronics. That would have seriously crippled the humans. I mean, they're always on their phones, right? What? Problem though, narratively speaking, we have no sense of the passage of time. 
How long has it been since the aliens revealed themselves? A week? A month? A year? A decade? We've no idea. Making it a little hard to relate to what's going on. The timeline is totally unclear, although it is an interesting journey. I like that they explored nuclear propulsion, which is something that had actually been proposed once as a method of space flight. And as for cryogenics, well, that's the most sci-fi human take we've got in this story. It is, and it will make it possible to follow one or more actors through the centuries, keeping the connection with the audience somewhat consistent. I thought the way they implemented the nuclear propulsion was ridiculous and bound to fail. Which it did anyway. It did, although... I'm sure we're bound to see Will's brain again at some point. Why do you say that? Because time is very precious in filmmaking, and a good film or TV show wouldn't waste such valuable commodity setting up an entire process, over hours in this case, just for it to lead to nothing. Can't do by? I did say a good film. But come on, whose bright idea was it to have the explosion between the sail and the capsule? Jen's. Indeed. An explosion in the middle would reach the sail and propel the vessel forward, it's true, but it would also affect the capsule, pushing it in the opposite direction, creating needless stress and drag. And breaking the cords connecting the capsule to the sail. Exactly what happened. What should have been needed was an explosion at the tail end of the ship with the sail placed there. You should have worked for way, dog. You'll never see me work for that child murderer. Okay, let's move on to Saul and the Wall Facer program. That was one weird concept. Desperate measures, desperate times. I get that the Santi are listening to every conversation, so know what the humans are planning. So a group of people just thinking of a plan sounds like a good idea, but humans live, what, 80, 90 years at best? So when they're about to die, if their plan's not ready, They'll have to tell somebody about it, and there goes the secrecy. Personally, I'm wondering if the Santee are messing with the humans. How so? Well, they obviously know they were formulating the Wolfessa program, and they knew they were going to use only three volunteers. So why not cripple one prong of that trident by pretending Sol is more important than he is by trying to kill him? Interesting. Although, he was one of the last persons to talk to UNG, so... He might know something important. Oh yeah, she told him a weird joke in the middle of episode 7. Maybe it was a clue? I'm guessing it must be a metaphor, something the Santee claim not to understand. What if God is the Santee and Einstein is the human race? Well, that is what happened. He knew God was there, was told by the angel not to play, but he played anyway, and got clobbered for his troubles. Which is what's going to happen to humanity. Then, I guess, humans might need to contact an even bigger god to clobber that god. There's always a bigger fish? Yeah, something like that. That would be one hell of a literal deus ex machina. And it would fit with a dark forest hypothesis. What's that? It's a proposed solution to the Fermi paradox. The reason no potential alien civilization out there is talking is because if someone hears them, they get wiped out by... A big bad wolf. So everyone keeps their head down, and it just so happens the second book of the series is called The Dark Forest. Coincidence? I think not. So, there you have it. Now, despite all this criticism, viewed as a whole, it's certainly worth taking a look. It's not perfect, but it's a good entertaining sci-fi story that's definitely worth watching if you haven't already. And with season two confirmed, there will be more of the story to be told. And as for those of you who have seen the show, What did you think of it? Did you like it? Do you agree with the points we raised? Did other stuff bother you instead? Whatever your thoughts, let us know. Live long, and may the force be with you.